Good morning. 17. We are doing chapter 17 this week, or unit 2. A uh, couple announcements for this week. Uh, first off, your reaction quiz for this week is posted. It's chapter 17. There's a link. It's a newspaper. You need to go read through the newspaper, answer the questions uh, that go along with the worksheet. When you are done, you'll just turn it in digitally. It is at the Google Classroom. It'll say chapter 17, uh, reaction quiz. I think most all of you have already, everyone got the syllabus quiz done. Uh, chapter 15 and 16 quizzes. Chapter 15 quiz is short. Chapter 16 is normal length, 25 questions. Uh, those are due today by the end of the day or about 10 p.m. I think it is what I put for time. So you've got today to finish those up. Uh, Fairfax, if you need a little extra time because you're still trying to get caught up, let me know. But we should be pretty close to being golden now. Uh, that being said, you see up on the board, those of you here in class right now, Chapter 17 Reaction Quiz is what it looks like. Each of you have got your own copy. It is posted. Uh, chapter 17. Uh, far as the lectures go this week, they will not be super long lectures most likely. Uh, we'll probably be done uh, Wednesday with the lecture series. Each one will probably be fairly short. Uh, so I'll lecture today, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, I am gone to a conference. So Thursday will probably be your day you, if you need to wrap up your Chapter 17 reaction quiz. It's a perfect day to get re, uh, caught up. And then Friday will be your normal quiz day um, in the class. Other thing before I forget, uh, those in Fairfax, you need to get this this book if you have not got it. I'm going to put more information about the book essay and read it. The Cold War uh, by John Lewis Gaddis. If you have not gotten this book or even the audio book, you can do an audio book if you prefer, but it would be hard as far as referencing. Um, it's not a super long book, but you need that. Uh, this will be required to read for the course, all my courses. Textbooks are provided. The, the, the main text is provided by the university, but the additional book um, is always uh, you need to provide. Um, and, and that is about 10 bucks on Amazon. Um, and then when you're done, you can resell it or uh, do what you like. It's a good book, uh, but I just want to put that on there if you were not uh, tracking with that. All right, so Freedom's Boundaries at Home and Abroad, Chapter 17, or Unit 2, or Lecture 2 series. So our questions, what were the origins and the significance of populism? How did the liberties of blacks after 1877 give way to legal segregation across the South? In what ways did the boundaries of American freedom grow narrow in this period, and how did the United States emerge as imperial power in the 1890s? Introduction. Um, One thing I had to cut uh, from chapter uh, 16 was the reaction quiz, which was the Men Who Built America episode. Uh, those of you who have seen it, uh, it goes into great detail of Carnegie Rockefeller. I know all the Rockport kids have watched it in my classes before. Um, it's a good series, and they like it. They've told me how many times they enjoy it. Uh, but one of the most popular songs in 1892 bore the title, My Father Was Killed by a Pinkerton Man. The reason I bring this up, if you go to the Homestead event and, and the men who built America, if you guys remember, they have the riot, they have the, uh, the, the picketing, they shut down Homestead, right? Well, Carnegie's key man, Henry Clay uh, Frick, brings in the Pinkerton men. Pinkerton men were basically hired uh, bodyguards. They're not assassins. They're not thugs. They are quality men who come in for one job, and that job is to either break up riots uh, uh, shutdowns, uh, strikes, or to provide security. In fact, Pinkertons had provided security for Lincoln at some point during his presidency. Point of this is, in the 1880s, 1890s, you have the rapid industrialization of the United States for a second time. However, with that comes massive wealth. That being said, you get people get filthy rich. And I've talked about castles being literally moved from Scotland, Ireland, Europe to the United States, but you also have a huge working class that is getting underpaid, and they're tired of it, they want benefits, they're tired of uh, bad events, and so the Homestead of events, and we talked about the Haymarket riots earlier, but this Homestead event really sends echoes throughout uh, the industrial community, and now things are going to start to change. 
people are tired, they want something else. So that being said, there's going to be a few movements during this period. They're going to have some effect, but not necessarily the effects you might always think of. And then there's going to be a shift in international and foreign policy. So we've been focused support, uh, all on the um, only America. We're going to start to look outside of America for the first time, really, and really start to change. And that being said, one other thing we'll get into besides the world of power in this chapter is also looking at Though we have all these improvements, or we are industrialized, the growing class, segregation is going to become even more uh, paramount um, and legalized. So there's a lot in Chapter 7 with Freedom Boundary at Home and Abroad. Okay, here's a short video of while you're watching the slide uh, about the Homestead Act, or so, home, not Homestead Act, uh, Homestead event. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about the bloodiest strike in American history. That's right, the Homestead Strike that happened at Carnegie Steel in 1892. 3,000 very angry workers attacked 300 other men in retaliation to the doings of Andrew Carnegie and Henry Clay Frick. Blood was shed, lives were taken, leaving a few body parts who were lost. All because a man wanted to increase his profits to make a little bit more than his already multi-million dollar income. So let's talk about Andrew Carnegie, the owner of the company. Like most people, he was a child before he was an adult. He came to America as a very poor boy and started working as a telegraph messenger and soon made his way up to be the personal secretary of Thomas Scott, who owned the Pennsylvania Railroad. After purchasing many stocks, Carnegie thought it would be best to start his own steel company, so he did just that. After growing his company, he finally purchased the mill at Homestead, Pennsylvania. Carnegie wanted to increase his profit, so he demanded a 25% wage debt, but the workers being part of the AISW made him sign a contract saying he wouldn't do anything to harm the pay of the workers. Now what is the AISW? It stands for the Amalgamated Association of Iron and Steel Workers. So the wages were fined up until the contract was over, that is. Carnegie had Henry Clay Frick, who was second in command of the steel mill, do all the dirty work when it came to dealing with the workers. Frick was known to be very aggressive in the workplace. That, and along with the fact that he was very much against labor unions, caused many people not to like him. With the end of the contract coming up, Freak wanted to get the most production done as possible, for he knew there would be a strike for what he was going to do. To protect him, Andrew Carnegie was sent on vacation to Scotland while Freak would take control of the plant. Freak had a 12-foot wall built around the entire plant. He finally demanded a 22% wage cut that had to be agreed upon by June 24th. The workers, of course, were outraged by this and did not accept his final demand. The three-year contract finally expired on June 9th and Frick closed the plant that day. Frick had no want for any of the workers entering the plant, so he had the local police keep watch for all hours of the day. Frick didn't think that was enough, though. He needed more power, more protection, and more people to start the mill up again. So who was he going to call? That's right, the Pinkerton agents. Frick hired 300 of them to come to Homestead to break up and remove the strikers and resume work in the mill. Pinkerton agents were people from a private detective agency, mainly used for solving crimes and special police cases, but they occasionally broke up strikes. They are known to be very tough and get the job done. Once the workers got word of this new employment, they knew something had to be done. The workers had lookouts from every edge of the city, waiting for their arrival. Upon hearing word, they finally caught the sight of them on the night of July 5th. The agents were coming up the Monongalaya River, making their new way in town in two armored scouts. The main leaders of the Union were trying to keep all the strikers calm, but it was of no use. They quickly surrounded the entire mill and rushed toward the edge of the river. The first shot fired was a direct hit to the Pinkerton leader, dropping him dead in front of all of his men. That morale boost was a big help for the strikers, along with the fact that there were 3,000 of them and only 300 of the agents. They raided the scouts as soon as they docked, firing cannons and throwing sticks of dynamite. The battle lasted for almost 24 hours. The strikers finally offered them a safe passage to a local skating rink, but this of course was a lie. Well, the safe passage part, at least. As soon as the agents were out, the strikers attacked them using things such as stones all the way to umbrellas. One of the men actually had his eyeball stabbed right out. They were taken to a skating rink, and by the end of it all, 14 men had died, and 63 were seriously injured. After keeping them locked in the rink overnight, the workers had finally sent all the remaining Pinkerton agents on a train to Pittsburgh in the morning. With the agents gone, the strikers were basically left in control of the mill. News quickly got to the president, and he had ordered Robert Pattinson <clears throat> Sorry, Robert Patterson, the governor of Pennsylvania, to send in 8,000 troops from the National Guard to restore order in the now carted city. Shortly after their arrival, they had cleared out all of the remaining workers and citizens from the mill, but there are still many strikers elsewhere in the city, though they are much less violent. 
There was a dry period where tensions were high, but violence was at a low. The only real violence that occurred during that period was when one of the strikers tried to assassinate Frick, but failed doing so. As time went on, the strikers were evacuated, and Frick was back in control of the mill. The entire workforce consisted of completely new workers, who had taken the pay what Carnegie was asking for, before the whole event had happened. All the lives lost and the lives ruined, just to make a little extra money. But that is the American dream for you. Rise from rags to riches, no matter the cost. Thank you. Okay. Pretty good video. It talks about a lot of those struggles at Homestead, Carnegie, and such. So you can see the drastic measures people went to. Now, the populist challenge. So not only are industry workers, industry workers, people working in factories, uh, complaining about what's going on. Farmers are kind of up in arms as well. Farmers revolt. After the Civil War, cotton prices plummeted with other parts of the world growing cotton. Sharecroppers were locked into perpetual poverty. Thus, most of the African Americans who were freed after the Civil War that were sharecropping were left in pretty desperate situations. Not to, not to be excluded was white poors as well. White farmers were also in this plight, so it wasn't just African Americans. Western farmers had mortgaged their property to purchase seed, fertilizer, and equipment uh, during uh, boom and bust times. Um, and now they are feeling the pressures of debt and low prices. Blamed high freight costs as a problem. They were not making much money. Uh, alliance formed, proposed the government build a warehouse to store crops until they were sold. Uh, this alliance will be centered out of Grange Halls, and they will originally be called Grange or Grange. Um, and that is where what we call the populist movement will be born. It will be born from farmers. Or it's also known as the People's Party. The alliance involved with the People's Party, the Populist Party. Uh, this basically was a party of farmers and rural people. Uh, miners were included. Some industrial workers were included. Not all of them will be uh, part of this group, though. Embarked in a re remarkable effort of community organization and education. They supported modern technologies, but want government to regulate them. Essentially, this was more a party in line with common Americans than uh, upper elites or status. Their platform was adopted in 1892 in Omaha, Nebraska. One of their big things was to restore democracy and economic opportunity uh, to the country. Public ownership of the railroads is something they also advocated because this was one of their biggest problems they had was freight. Any modern business today, one of the drawbacks, as my wife has found out with uh, selling stuff on Etsy, is you can make good products, but you may have to keep your prices high because of shipping. Shipping is a killer. That's why Amazon Prime, go back a few years ago when they offered Amazon Prime, now it's like 130 bucks a, a, a year. But when it came out when it was originally like $80, $90 a year, that was pretty crazy, right? Free two-day shipping. Also, I was watching an episode, started watching The Ranch last night, which is pretty funny, pretty crazy. Probably You guys probably shouldn't watch it. But one of the comments early in the episodes was, I think it was episode two, there was a problem with the truck, they needed some little part, and he goes, well, I can just order it on Amazon, I'll be here in 24 hours. And the dad said, no, well, it's wrong of you people not going out and meeting with people and actually going and buying stuff. People, if Fred down the street doesn't have it, we'll go over to Yon Beer and get it. And it was just like, whole different world. Um, but shipping um, is still relevant, and obviously today we have sped up shipping, but cost is still, still there. Populist challenge two. Uh, the Populist Coalition. Uh, they tried to unite all poor farmers in the South, white and black. They were not racial on that part. They needed both. Uh, Democrats turned to typical racist weights to prevent the blacks uh, from voting in this. So this was an attempt to limit them, and they did successfully limit a lot of black vote. But this was an attempt to unite all uh, poor farmers into one party. James Weaver won one million votes in the 1892 election and won five western states. Though the popular, this is the closest the populace will probably ever get into the White House. Uh, their candidate carried five states and that's pretty significant um, for a candidate to carry, let alone uh, one state, uh, five states. That's not part of the Republican or Democratic Party. To put it in perspective, the only major third party candidate to win any states outside of this is really Theodore Roosevelt, who we'll get to later with the Bull Moose Party. However, this will not be a long-lasting event. 
The government and labor depression of 1893 led to increased conflict between capital and labor opportunity. There was an opportunity here to expand, but it's not going to be super effective. A guy named Kowaxi uh, had an army, which a band of several hundred unemployed men led by Ohio businessman Jake and Co Jacob Kowaxi dispersed by federal troops, but they were basically going around pillaging a group of unemployed workers going across the, the landscape uh, just being a disruptive force. Though federal troops will disband them, this was this was not a good situation. The American Railway Union strike. Supreme Court once again uh, back business over union. Uh, when they struck or when they go on a strike, they will back biz big business. So government really didn't do much to regulate labor or businesses at this point. And any time it went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court always backed business. It's going to take a powerful person to reverse this, and I alluded to him a little bit earlier, but Teddy Roosevelt is going to shift this balance. Until he comes to the office, uh, this is not going to be a reality that the small person is going to really have much say in court when it comes to business. Uh, many felt, uh, many left the Democratic Party and went to the Populist Party. In rural areas, the Populist vote increased in 1894, reaching their real true apex. However, many industrial workers supported the Republican higher attempt to protect manufacturing. So, the populace garnered or got some support from uh, business workers. The reality was they could never get them to vote in the presidential elections because they wa they wanted the high tariff to protect American manufacturing, which was their bread and butter. So, the, the populist party is never going to get massive support. They are making dents. They, at the local level, they're pretty effective, but at the federal level, they're not. They're going to be very, very short-lived. They're going to be like a spark. They're going to flame, and then it's like when you try to burn leaves, put some gas on there, flames up, gets really hot for a minute, and then what happens? It just dies, right? Uh, so the populists are basically going to be subjugated to the Democratic Party. They're going to have to join with the Democrats um, to have any. Uh, chance at taking the White House. Uh, Democrats and populists joined to support a guy named William Jennings Bryan in 1896. William Jennings Bryan literally ran for president like four times, lost every single time. Uh, William Jennings Bryan has a little connection to our lo locality, he is from Nebraska, I believe he was from Omaha. Uh, he is from Nebraska, but I think it was Omaha, maybe Lincoln. Uh, but he's an important figure that will be have many stops in American history. He condemned the gold standard, which the currency at the time was based on. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of gold, as he was famous. To put it in perspective, William Jennings Bryan was a devout Christian, very conservative Protestant. Um, and so he was equating uh, our gold standard as a basically a sin, um, and, uh, and we were putting ourselves upon it. He wanted free silver, unrestricted mining of silver money, and he wanted to use silver to uh, back U.S. currency. You say, why would we go from gold to silver? Well, the strongest currency in the world is backed by what? Silver, sterling silver, the British pound, which is by large, it had been, I need to double check, uh, Brexit may have thrown everything into a discord, uh, but the, the sterling pound is, is the most powerful currency in the world of the British pound. But the devout religious man who was strongly influenced by the social gospel as well, helping the urban poor and using money for the betterment of man. Uh, Brian will run. Now, the campaign of 1896 will come down between Bryan and William McKinley. He was backed by lots of money and business. Essentially, if you've watched the extension, extensive episodes of The Men Who Built America, one thing comes out about McKinley. McKinley was essentially bought and paid for by the rich men of America. Uh, the Rockefeller, Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, who we haven't really talked about with the, his business of uh, creating U.S. Steel and his banking. But they're essentially going to say, McKinley will support us. He ain't going to fight us. Um, we're going to support him. We're going to raise him up. We'll make sure he gets elected, and which he did. It's a very close election, but broke the gridlock of years of, of past and submitted Republican control uh, until 1932. What McKinley will represent is big business, uh, for at least a short period, is going to dominate uh, American political thought and allow basically what to do what they want, as long as McKinley's it. Now, Fast forward to the election of 1900, there's a young rising star in the Republican Party named Theodore Roosevelt, who the businessmen feared. 
So they said, where is the least effective place a politician can really be um, in government? Well, they reasoned the vice presidency. And so in 1900, they basically push uh, Teddy Roosevelt to the vice presidency with McKinley, which we'll find out more later how that was a disastrous decision uh, by those key businessmen. But 1896, um, McKinley will win, and the Republicans will have control of the um, con or Congress, the White House, um, basically all government control for about 35 years until the Great Depression. That being said, one other thing to add that's, uh, I don't know if it's talked about in the book, um, I can't remember the author's name, but the story, Wizard of Oz, was written during this time period. Yeah, The Wizard of Oz was not written all, all of a sudden in the 1930s to make a cool colored movie. It was a book written in the 1880s and 1890s. Actually, I think it was 1890s. In the original story of Wizard of Oz, and I know you've all, you've all seen it, right? Or know the concept? What does she wear to go home? What does she click her heels? The red shoes. Red slippers, right? And she goes, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. In the original book, and I know I've talked about this before, Aiden, what color was the shoes in the original book? Silver. They were silver shoes in the original book as a tribute to William Jennings Bryan in support of the silver standard. The author knew William Jennings Bryan and supported him. It was a subtle way to throw the support into it. However, come the 1930s when Hollywood is making movies, the new revelation in movies is what? Color. Movies are starting to be made in color. And thus, silver shoes on the big screen would have looked boring, dull, and really stuffy. So they make them red ruby slippers, and they kind of alter that story aspect a little bit. Just a fun little tidbit of information there to go along with William Jennings Bryan and the silver standard. Uh, just so you understand, today, in the 70s of Nixon, are we are no longer attached to the gold standard as much as we are attached to the markets uh, in the United States. And it's a, it's a real tricky thing. I completely understand it. Um, we still have lots of uh, gold in the U.S. Reserve that we back a lot of our currency with, but it's more tied to the markets um, and such. Okay, this is a, we're going to stop for today. Uh, tomorrow, we'll get into the segregated South, and then uh, probably get into redrawing the boundaries. And then Wednesdays, we'll talk about becoming a world power um, and a little bit of the age of imperialism. Um, and what happens when we know known as a war that most Americans can't identify known as the Spanish-American uh, War and makes one Teddy Roosevelt very, very, very famous. Um, if you have questions, please do not email me. I'm not going to, yes, email me. I will answer them. Um, hope all of you are in a happy mood today for the Chiefs' domination of the Colts. First time in my lifetime uh, that I can remember. I mean, I barely remember Joe Montagna, uh, the Chiefs being in the AFC Championship game. So, a little bit of fun stuff. Also looking ahead, uh, no school next Monday for Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Uh, but looking at the weekend, it looks like we're going to get another round of heavy snow. So uh, we're prepared for that. Um, we'll see if the game even gets in on Friday or not. Hopefully it does. But have a good day. Happy Monday. Good rest of the week.